الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وأن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise and glory be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Certainly Allah is deserving of the best thanks and the most beautiful praises. And we testify that no one is worthy of worship but Allah alone without any partners, the true supreme king. And that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was indeed in truth without doubt, his prophet and his servant and his messenger. So with the theme of this conference being healing humanity, Allow me to be frank at the onset. It is difficult to imagine that this ummah would be involved or at the forefront of healing humanity as it once was before it is done or gaining ground or making gains on its own health first, healing itself first, beginning to enjoy great health on its own. And great health could mean its spiritual health, its intellectual health, its scientific health, its industrial health, its physical health, its financial health, its moral health. And that last one in particular is what I wish to spend the next 18 or so minutes on, the role of our moral health, our moral greatness, and how operative how consequential, how essential that is towards our mission, our duty of healing humanity. So we all know that Allah Azza wa Jal said about His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Right? You are upon great character. And when Allah the Most High says great character, it's truly great character. But perhaps the most incredible aspects of our Prophet ﷺ's great character and what truly puts him at the undisputed pinnacle, the unmatched top apex of human excellence is not just that he mastered a certain number of virtues or all the particular virtues, but the fact that he was able to finesse the balance between all of those virtues at the exact same time. And an example would probably help a lot. So I usually like to portray or illustrate the following scene. Picture with me that the hypocrite has finally died in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ knew full well that he was a hypocrite. And yet he ﷺ insists on wrapping him in his own shirt as his shroud and blowing his breath into his mouth before burying him so that the last thing he contracts from this world is the blessed breath of our Prophet ﷺ. And then he continues praying for his forgiveness and continues praying for his forgiveness to the point that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu comes and stands by the Prophet ﷺ's side and he begins to protest and he begins to remind the Prophet ﷺ that this is no ordinary hypocrite. That Ibn Salul is the man who would publicly insult you and taunt you for a decade. This is the man that deserted the Muslims that were already undersized right before the Battle of Uhud started with a third of the group and he defected. This is the man that made up and spread filthy stories about your wife Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And by doing that, he was accusing you as well of housing under your roof an unchaste woman while you were totally oblivious to it. He's the one that did and did. You cannot. No, no, no. You cannot seek forgiveness for him. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Standing at the grave of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he says, Ta'akhar anni ya Umar. O Umar, step back. Back away. 
leave me alone. And he continues to seek forgiveness for him until Allah Azza wa Jal reveals, in tastaghfir lahum sab'eena marratan falan yaghfir Allahu lahum. Which essentially means it doesn't make much of a difference whether you seek forgiveness for them, the hypocrites, or you don't seek forgiveness for them. Even if you were to seek forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah would still not forgive them. Innahum kafaru because they disbelieved. And so at that point, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he said, لَوْ أَنِّي أَعْلَمُ if I knew, لَوْ زِدْتُ عَلَى السَّبْعِينِ غُفِرَ السَّبْعِينَ غُفِرَ لَهُ لَزِدْ If I knew that seeking forgiveness more than 70 times would have gotten him forgiven, I would have sought forgiveness more than 70 times. And he stopped there and didn't proceed any further after Allah's verse comes down. Picture what just happened here in light of finessing the balance that we're talking about. This is not just our Prophet وسلم, ascending to a point where he is able to be gracious and be forgiving and not hold a grudge and live and let live, though that by itself is something we can spend our lifetime not being able to do with people that wrong us. He climbs to an even higher level where he's not just forgiving this person, he's concerned about this person, he's compassionate with this person, he's hopeful that this person may somehow survive, may somehow attain salvation. And then he doesn't just stop there, he continues to climb even further to being committed ultimately above and before all, devoted ultimately to the boundaries of Allah Azza wa Jal, so that when Allah tells him to stop, he stops alayhi salatu wasalam. Finessing that balance of being selfless and then being compassionate and then being devoted, that is the pinnacle of human excellence. It's not an easy task. That's why you find it best and most with the prophets. And not even just any prophets, the best of the best of the prophets have truly mastered this balance. You find in the Quran that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah says about him, he came pleading with us regarding the people of Lut, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. These people, Allah was going to destroy them. Before he destroyed them, he informs Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam begs Allah, pleads with Allah to spare them. Like you'd think Ibrahim alayhi salam above anybody else will be like, finally, get rid of this cancer that's uh, destroying humanity. He still had mercy for them. But that's not the only thing he had. Allah Azza wa continues to say, Inna Ibrahim halimun awahum munib. Ibrahim is so forbearing. It's beautiful of him to feel that way despite everything he's been through personally at the hands of those defiant of the prophets and the messages of God. Ibrahim is so forbearing, but at the same time, he is always calling out to us and always resigning to our judgment, always rushing back to us. Ya Ibrahim a'rid an hadha. O Ibrahim, leave this alone. Meaning the decision is finalized, do not interfere. And Ibrahim alayhi salam did not fumble the balance between compassion for humanity and between commitment to the bounds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not easy. You know, interestingly, I always remember the story of Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, rahimahullah, and it is related, so just bear with me. Al-Fudayl rahimahullah, when his son died, he was seen cheerful or laughing at the funeral of his son. And so they said to him, like, how can you be laughing at the funeral of your child? He said, I wanted to show Allah that I was pleased with his decree. You know, for a moment you say, wow, mashallah, that's impressive. It is at face value because some of us can't even be that. But this incident caused a big problem for many people. Because the Prophet wasallam cried when his son Ibrahim died. And so how can Al-Fudayl have more iman, more faith, or more contentment with the qadr of Allah than our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It doesn't add up. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and this is perhaps of the reasons why he's Shaykh al-Islam, he resolves it and he says, no, what actually happened here is that al-Fudayl rahimahullah, who is a man of great caliber, a man who we will never attain his ranks most likely, but still, he's not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he's not Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said Al-Fudayl was not able to combine in his heart 
mercy for Allah's creation and contentment with Allah's determinations, Allah's destiny. So he threw out mercy with Allah's creation, for Allah's creation, so that he can be able to hold on to being content with destiny. He had to pick one. He says, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, whereas the guidance of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it is more perfect and more complete. Where he combined between both, he fused between both when his son Ibrahim died. And he said, the eye tears and the heart aches, but we only say that which pleases our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does this have to do with moral excellence? Allah's destiny, the laws in his universe and what he destines, in this respect is not at all different from Allah's laws, his ahkam, his judgments regarding the behavior of human beings, how we are and aren't supposed to be living our lives. Both of those judgments, we have to accept them while still balancing that with being compassionate with human beings because many a times we fumble this. We're trying to be so compassionate with human beings that we don't want to pass judgments on right and wrong anymore, which is an issue because Allah passed certain judgments. At the other end, sometimes we want to commit ourselves so diligently in a beautiful way to Allah's boundaries that we wind up being callous with Allah's creation. And so here is the idea. Are we allowed to be judgmental as Muslims? Or are we allowed to judge people as Muslims? Well, it depends what you mean by judge people. If judge people means you judge their fate, like this person deserves to live, this person deserves to die, arbitrarily, just like that. Or judge people as in this person is going to hell, this person is going to heaven on some individual level, then absolutely not. We're not allowed to judge people as Muslims. But are we allowed to judge people as in their behavior in terms of facts, not their fate, the facts? What is truth? What is falsehood? What is right? What is wrong? We are obligated to do that as Muslims. We are obligated to say what Allah said and judge as Allah judged and accept what Allah accepted and reject what Allah rejected, at least in principle, if we can't do anything else. Because Allah Azza wa Jal said to us, Inna anzalna ilayka al kitaba bil haqqi we have sent down the book upon you with truth. It is the definition of truth. So that you may be able to discern, to judge between people using what Allah has shown you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when you judge, you kind of have to, out of compliance with your commitment to Allah, and also out of concern for humanity, because Allah legislates and shows us what's in our best interest. So if we really are concerned, a part of that is going to be presenting to people, not withholding, not compromising Allah's defined guidance, His definitive guidance, His revealed guidance, His gift to us. And also we can judge from the perspective of I need to be able to add value to different actions so I know what to be grateful for. Like I need to be able to say me being at the masjid at 7.30 p.m. to pray Isha is better, more valuable than me being standing at the door of the club waiting to get in at 7.30 on the same night. Right or wrong? I have to be able to judge that. But if I'm going to judge that from a place of ownership, as if I own my own guidance, and I'm inherently superior to that person, absolutely not. They could be in the masjid tomorrow and you can be out there. That would be arrogance. Am I allowed to judge people from a place of contempt where I'm hateful of them and their well-being and I don't wish for them to prosper? Absolutely not. In fact, the Prophet wasallam, when he passed a judgment on a person who kept battling and falling into alcoholism, he carried out the judgment. But when people said words that reflected contempt, they said how wicked this person is, how cursed he is. The Prophet ﷺ stopped them there and he said, Do not curse such a person because this person loves Allah and His Messenger. And so we will have to judge, but that will not eclipse us wishing well for people because that's inseparable from our Islam. We cannot separate that. Islam is the religion of Allah. Allah's mercy is wider than His anger. Allah wishes for us to show goodwill to people. 
When the Prophet ﷺ says, the religion is goodwill, what does that mean? It's almost like him saying, Hajj is Arafah. Hajj is a lot of things, it's not just Arafah. But if you miss Arafah, you miss Hajj. Likewise, if you miss Nasiha, if you wish, miss having goodwill for people, you've missed everything. You've missed the whole point. That doesn't necessitate or mean or entail that we're ever going to fully be able to separate between uh, the sin and the sinner. That just really doesn't make sense. It's just not even logical. Like, is it natural for me to feel exactly the same about my neighbor who puts brownies in front of my door every single day and my other neighbor who steals the brownies before I get home from work every single day? Would that be natural? And this is, we're not feeling towards people the way we feel on a very selfish level. We're saying Allah Azza wa Jal is the center of our world, the center of our concerns. Those that do things that bring them closer to Allah, we try to bring them closer to ourselves. It is natural. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the most beloved of you to me and those that sit closest to me on the day of judgment are those that are best in character, right? Character with Allah, character with the people. And so we're not going to be able to fully ignore the link between the sin and the sinner, but the point is that it's not going to eclipse, finessing the balance. It's not going to overwhelm, make us forget, eclipse the dominant aspect of our Islam the central aspect of our Islam, which is still wishing well for these people no matter what. And you know, there's a, a beautiful incident from Abu, Dar, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he saw some people cursing at, insulting a sinner. And so he said to them, if you would have found this man in a well, stuck inside a well, wouldn't you pull him out? They said, of course. He said, فَلَا تَسُبُّ أَخَاكُمْ وَحْمَدُ اللَّهَ الَّذِي عَفَاكُمْ Then stop cursing at your brother. You're stuffing him further. You're not helping him by doing this. Then stop cursing your brother and just thank your Lord who spared you. They said, أَفَلَا تُبْغِضُهُ They said to him, don't you hate him? Don't you hate the sinner? قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَبْغَضُ عَمَلَهُ فَإِن تَرَكَهُ فَهُوَ أَخِي He's saying, what I hate this must in, be interpreted to mean what I really hate, what I hate most. What I really hate is his sin. Once he gives it up, he returns to being my full brother. Meaning I don't hate him inherently. I don't hate her inherently. It's just the inseparability is impossible sometimes, but you still wish well for them more than anything else. Because you see that this person is a family member. They're part of the human family. And you see that you are required as part of your faith to love for people, all people, what you love for yourself. You know what that means, by the way. First of all, and now Rahimullah says the correct interpretation because of other wordings of this hadith that you don't believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. He's saying the brotherhood of humanity is what's intended here according to the stronger view. And Ibn Rajab Rahimullah says something very interesting. He says what that means is you're supposed to wish, you're supposed to long and wish as part of your faith that the person you're looking at be better than you, not just like you. Why? He said, because you're supposed to love for others what you love for yourself, right? And you're supposed to love for yourself to be higher than you currently are. So you're supposed to love for others to be higher than you currently are. That is the sentiment that is part of the requirements of your faith as a Muslim. And so how do I know if I feel this way? What's the litmus test for this? Because I don't have any time left. It's very hard to gauge your emotions. And so our deen didn't leave us to gauge our emotions in a, a very obscure way. It gave us guidelines for, that reflect how we feel at heart, how it translates on the outside. Here's a good guideline you can always use with yourself. The Prophet wasallam said, لَا تَكُونُوا عَوْنًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَىٰ أَخِيكُمْ Do not be an aid for shaitan against your brother. So how do you treat this person? Do you treat this person like someone that wants to hand them off to shaitan, pushing them further down the path? Or do you treat them in a way that wins them over to you, closer to the path of a rahman closer to the path of Allah, and you distance them from the shaitan? If that is how you gauge things, then you wish well for them. And so will you distance yourself from them when they, whenever they commit a sin? 
That would not be allowed in Islam. Boycotting a Muslim in Islam is only allowed when there's like a super clear benefit in doing that. And when people commit sins, they need you now more than ever. So how can you distance yourself from them except that you're, you need to know that you're handing them over to shaitan? Also of the ways that you don't help shaitan against your brothers and sisters in humanity is that you are sensitive to their conditions. The Prophet wasallam tried to advise a person that was weeping at the grave and when he saw she was not ready for advice, she didn't even realize who was speaking to her. She said, get away from me, get away from me. You're not going through what I'm going through. He let her be. He was sensitive to her condition. And then when she came, now she's coming, so she's going to be receptive. That's when he gave her the advice and said, patience, it really matters when calamities first strike. So being sensitive to people. And even in our time, I'll conclude with these two things. Even in our time, being sensitive to the fact that the dominant culture has riddled people's minds with doubts. And so don't just dump information on them without realizing that this information could, could destroy them. The same way really good steak, you know, could kill a baby because they're not ready for it, right? An overload of information without the proper tools to process it could kill someone's faith. You know, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an Sahih al-Bukhari, it's reported about him that he said, address people according to their wavelengths basically their rationale in a way they can comprehend would one of you like that Allah and his messenger be considered liars be belied you know many people nowadays the way they just dump Islam on people or provoke people with truth about Islam in the name of pride or whatever else or being principled or uncompromising or whatever it's as if they are saying so what say it how it, how it is we don't care good for them yeah, we want them to belie Allah and His Messenger. They were faking it all along anyway. This is what I hear in their behavior. Why do that to somebody? Do you want them to be picked up and rescued or not? And I'll end with this incident. Two of the great Imams of the Tabi'een, one of them, he was, his name was Al-Nakha'i, Ibrahim Nakha'i, rahimahullah. He had a limp in his foot. He would limp when he walked. And one of his students was Al-A'mash, rahimahullah, so Imam Mahran al-A'mash, he had a bleary eye, he had one bad eye. So when they were walking into the city one day, he said to him, let's take different streets because it looks like kind of funny, you know, like a guy with a limp and a guy with a bad eye. So it looks like the scholars are all like impaired. It looks like, they're just like, it's awkward. Like there's not a, a, a person who's like flawless amongst you. And so al-A'mash rahimahullah said to him, so what? Let's walk together. What does it harm us that we get the good deeds for being made fun of and they get the sins for making fun of us? So an Nakha'i rahimahullah, he said to him, and what does it harm you that we get saved from being made fun of and they get saved, meaning from committing that sin? Those are beautiful hearts, pure hearts, balanced hearts that soaked in revelation and and lived these gems. Many a times even, you know, as one of the, the writers, he said, if Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah had a social media account today, would he post things that were provocative and were just gross generalizations and carelessly or deliberately, you know, uh, spo spark and stoke controversies? Or would he do, as many of the early Muslims did, worry about the guidance of the people and say to Allah Azza wa Jal in the depths of the night or in their sujood, Oh Allah, protect us and protect Islam and the Muslims from us. Jazakallahu khairan wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.